right, so in this video, we are going to talk about one pretty significant change that came with version 6.2, and that is the ability to disable or turn off dropout protection. Okay, so what is dropout protection? I've done a ton of videos on this, so I don't want to repeat myself too much, but essentially it was something that was introduced in 3.5, and it basically gave parallel paths, and it offered the user the ability to have dual buffers running, one that's handling all the playback, and one buffer that is in its own path with super low latency, and then the two paths get merged together for playback. So if we take a look at my settings, I pretty much have the settings the same all the time, 32 samples in terms of my device block size, and my dropout protection is set to medium. This gives me a rock solid 2.5 milliseconds of round trip latency. Regardless of whether I'm running a big session, producing, mixing, or anything, I can track vocals absolutely no problem. Now, I love this combination, and it's been rock solid for me, but there's one area where it really kind of, I guess you could just say that it's bothersome, and that is whenever you need to do a punch-in. So let me go ahead over here. The configuration that I use all the time is tape style monitoring. What that basically means is that, change my monitoring, if I now monitor my voice over here, I can record on the track and then I'm able to hear it when I'm stopping. So let's go ahead and record something. I'm just gonna record something here and the idea is that I wanna just punch something in. Let's say that I made a mistake here. Whoops, and I gotta punch in and, and fix this mistake. So now if I go back with this combination of monitoring, if I play back, I wanna just punch something in. Let's. We are hearing my previously recorded take, but the minute I stop, we're hearing my live input. And if I record, we're gonna hear my live input. So the question is, how do you do a punch in with this setup? Well, you have to simply record on the track and you use monitoring, mutes, playback, tape style, and then we can do this. I wanna just punch something in, and now I'm just gonna fix this mistake and I'm gonna to try to punch out here and, and fix this mistake. Okay, so that's the way that you punch in. But notice there, when we were doing that, I'm not able to hear my live input. I only hear the playback. Now, if I'm trying to match my tone, this is really important for like somebody in terms of matching their dynamics or a singer who needs to match the singing style that he or she was singing, it's hard to do because I can't hear anything. I wanna just punch something in. Let's say that I made a mistake here. Check, 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 check. That makes it difficult. Now, previous to version 3.5, Studio One, I guess it was 3.4, anything before 3.5, you had the ability to monitor and record on the track, and you didn't have to worry about this. And then regardless of whether you were in record mode or playback, you could hear both. And I absolutely love that. So let's open up our performance monitor over here. We can enable or disable dropout protection from our performance monitor, or we can also enable it or disable it from our preferences. I'm just going to use the performance monitor option. Now I'm going to turn this off completely. Okay, so now we, let's keep an eye actually on our CPU over here. And keep in mind, this is also not my total CPU. This is just the largest load on any single core uh, or stream of your CPU or strand of your CPU, however you want to say it. Now take a look at this. When I play back, I'm just going to record something check, here. Check. And I can merge the them. idea is that I want to just punch something this in. Let's say that I made a mistake kind here. of a big deal because this allows me to merge both of the inputs together. And now we don't have any issue in terms of punching in. So if I did need to punch in, I would have to have said something that makes a little bit more sense. So maybe let's activate a click over here. We'll record this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So now if I stop this, if I need to match the inflection, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. I have a lot better chance of matching the inflection and doing something that is hopefully seamless. Four. One, two, three, four. So I think this is kind of a big deal. Now, I have tested this a little bit and uh, what I have noticed is when I use this in heavier sessions, that it was, um, it, it put a little bit too much in terms of a percentage on my CPU. So I think what I will probably do is I will continue using dropout protection in my workflow, but if ever I am recording an artist and he or she wants to hear what they played back and they want to play along to it and they want to hear the previously recorded performance and the new performance that they're recording, then I will definitely toggle this option off, drop a protection off, so I can go back to that behavior only when needed, and then when I'm done, I'll just pop back into 
my dropout protection mode that I like to work in and everything will be good to go. Now, I know this is kind of funny that I'm saying this because this is the first time I've had to mention this in a while, but keep in mind, if your dropout protection is set to off, then your whole entire system will be going based on this device block size in terms of the buffer range. On newer computers, this shouldn't be an issue, but on older systems, this might make your audio um, prone to glitches or dropouts or spikes, and they could end up getting recorded on there. So this is something kind of like use it with care, use it with caution. Now, another byproduct of the dropout protection stuff, when we talk about um, virtual instruments, and this is a bit of a weird one, but there was always a sweet spot when working with dropout protection. So if I'm going to re-enable this, this is set to medium. Take a look at what's indicated over here. The instrument with these settings, a device block size of 32 and medium dropout protection, which is a 512 buffer essentially. Notice the reported or the standard round trip latency of both the audio and the virtual instrument. And then notice what gets reported after low latency. Now the the really kind of quirky thing about working with instruments and in dropout protection was that even though this kind of seems counterintuitive, you actually ended up getting a lower round trip latency when you set your device block size to 64 instead of 32. So take a look at this over here. We have 4.33 in terms of our round trip latency, and that's at 32 samples. Now watch this. I'm going to change this to 64, and now we'll go back over here, and now we have 3.0 milliseconds. So any time that I was working with virtual instruments and I have my dropout protection, I would just change my buffer over to 64 because this was the way that I could just automatically kind of get around this. Now, in the case of not using dropout protection, I would say that you could leave this at 32. And then if we come over here and we disable this, now we have instrument, look at this, we have 1.67 seconds of round trip latency. So this is the lowest I've ever seen in terms of virtual instruments, right? 1.67. Let's toggle this now to 64 and let's see what this says. Now the 64 is equal to the three milliseconds and let's see, let's toggle this to 16 and let's see what ends up happening for our virtual instruments. One millisecond. That's pretty nuts. I'm going to have to experiment with that. Now this is obviously going to be, this could cause havoc on your system, right? Because keep in mind 16 samples, that's a terribly low buffer. I would probably just be happy with 32 and set this at, uh, you know, 1.67. And then we would just kind of have to monitor our performance of our CPU and see where things are kind of sitting. But the ability to enable or disable dropout protection, I think it's kind of important, especially for people who wanted a bit more flexibility and control over those settings. I know that I will be using it anytime I need to do a punch-in where an artist needs to hear both things. And I will also be experimenting with respect to how it works with virtual instruments, not necessarily in a blank session with nothing loaded, but in a session where I've got quite a few plugins going and quite a few virtual instruments. I'd be really interested to see how it works. If you have checked it out, disable and drop out protection with virtual instruments, and you'd like to share your results, leave it in the comments below. I'm sure there was lots of people who'd be interested in hearing about that. Anyways, that's it for this video. Hope you enjoyed it. Catch you in the next one. Cheers.